Okay, male circumcision. Circumcision, circumcision. This episode is about male circumcision. Hi there! <laughs> oh, I see you're circumcised. Gosh, I'm about to get in so much trouble. That's me. 100% natural. <laughs> Male circumcision is the removal of the foreskin of the penis. This is a commonly uh, practiced rite of passage for Muslims, Jewish people, and a number of other communities. It's widely practiced across Africa, and a third of all men around the world are thought to have been circumcised. So I went from this to this. In the UK, we did used to practice circumcision. In Victorian times, it was thought to be a good deterrent of masturbation. Observe the vile masturbator. After the Second World War, with the establishment of the uh, NHS, it was kind of phased out. And so in the UK, it's only about 8% of men who have been circumcised. When I started working at The Guardian, I worked on the End FGM campaign. It's a very different issue, it's a different subject. But I had a lot of men approach me and say, what about male circumcision? And I realised there was kind of a sentiment behind uh, male circumcision, a feeling that that needed to be questioned or to be stopped altogether. It's a barbaric practice that people only do because it was done to them and because you feel like it's a part of tradition. Looking at some of the debate around this, I've noticed that there are some quite extreme voices and this can be quite a thorny issue to get into. I want to go out and speak to men who can tell me what it's like for them and explain to me their perspectives on this. It's going to be difficult but I'm coming to this I hope with the right attitude. Uh, I'm not going to look at the comments, I'm not reading the comments, I'm not going to look at the comments at all because I'm terrified um, but I, I'm just trying to inform myself and hopefully share that journey with you. This is my first interview about um, Male circumcision? Sure, yeah, that's un unsurprising. <laughs> <laughs> so I've decided to start this conversation uh, by going and speaking to the actor and comedian Tom Rosenthal from Channel 4's Friday Night Dinner and ITV's Plebs. I'm about to be circumcised by a barber. All right, hit your tuna cup, please, fam. Last year, he did a stand-up show called Manhood, which was focused entirely around his circumcision. So I thought he'd be a great person to start this conversation with. Why is it that you were circumcised? You know, broadly, kind of like cultural, uh, aesthetic and sort of hygienic reasons, which I sort of investigated and have decided are all bullshit. Can I say bullshit on The Guardian? Is that allowed? I feel yeah. they're, they're bullshit. <laughs> My friends think I'm, I'm obsessed with this stuff. I'm not obsessed, but like, look at this. Wouldn't you be annoyed? <laughs> How can you tell if you haven't had a foreskin how can you tell that something is missing? It felt uncomfortable um, in a way that uh, it doesn't when that bit is covered. A bit of my skin is exposed in a way that it shouldn't be exposed. I, I just had that intuition. Ah! 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 No, no, I can't. Holy shit, that hurt! I've grown up kind of furious about uh, this thing that happened to me, um, maybe from about adolescence. What I wanted to do was to try and uh, put that story in the public domain in a kind of palatable way. Girls try to make me feel better after shows, man. They come up to me and they're like, you know what, Tom? I actually like circumcised dicks. I actually like them. It's like, all right, cool. That's not about me. That doesn't make me feel better. That's about you, you know? Like, I like boxing. But if you were a victim of domestic abuse, I wouldn't try and console you with that fact. You talked about Sex in the City, right? And just so happened, the episode I watched last night, not looking for it, was the one about circumcision. There was so much skin. It was like a Sharpay. You're dating the guy, not the penis. Aesthetics are important to me. It's not what it looks like, it's what they can do with it. Well, I don't need one that can make its own carrying case. <laughs> I felt quite guilty as a woman. I was watching it being like, yeah, I've definitely heard these conversations happen a lot and it happens so flippantly. Aesthetic preferences um, are one thing, but forcing them on a child who has no choice is a completely other thing. Some people feel like me. Some people feel that they should have had a choice. There is no reason to cut a child if there is no medical necessity to do that. It's not, why shouldn't we do it? It's why should we do it? The conversation with Tom was really informative and kind of set out the specific areas that I felt I needed to explore further in this conversation about male circumcision. The truth is, though, that the numbers are so much higher in the United States. Around 70% of adult men have been circumcised. So I felt like it was really important to ask men there, when I was in New York, what their thoughts are on male circumcision. <laughs> if you had kids in the future, if you had a son, do you think you would, you would get him circumcised or not? No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, sure. You would? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Probably up to my wife's no, choice, no, I don't yeah. know. Honestly, I feel like, like, I feel like that, I mean, I haven't thought about it. I think I would. And why do you think you would? I feel like it's just cleaner. I was like that. I'm pretty sure my father was like that as well. My grandfather was like that as well. See, I'm Muslim, so we we have to do it. I am proudly Jewish, and I do think optically, like the way it looks, just looks better and cleaner. I'm proud of my own circumcision. <laughs> Some of like the sexual partners that I've had, um, they prefer penises that are circumcised. Like the aesthetic of it, like it looks better. I think. I don't even know what an uncircumcised penis looks like. I could show you on a phone, but I, uh, I'll, I'll let you do that oh, later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so while I'm from a community that practices male circumcision, I'm from a Muslim community. Most of the things I've seen that talk about circumcision are probably the Joe Rogan podcast, the TV shows, and most of the time it's linked to the Jewish practice. Don't you boys know what a bris is? They're going to circumcise him. What's that? Oh boy. So I went to go and speak to Cantor Philip Sherman, who says that he's practiced around 20,000 brisses. I wanted to understand more about how it's done and why it's so important for Jewish people to be able to practice this. You know, this is the first time I've ever been to a synagogue. Okay. This is a conservative synagogue. Men and women sit together. In a traditional Orthodox synagogue, they sit separately, so either in a balcony or they'll have a partition down the way. All synagogues have in common a, an ark and inside are the Torah scrolls. I get an RE lesson, this is amazing. I, I really wanted to cover the fact that it's such a meaningful thing for the people of the Jewish faith. Well, the bris is the entrance of the child into the covenant of Abraham. And throughout history, this is something which the Jewish people have done often under great historical duress. It was forbidden, sometimes under penalty of death. So for the Jewish world, this is part of a covenant has nothing to do with health reasons or cleanliness as may be found elsewhere. Can you explain to me how it happens? Like I've never been to a bris. I haven't even been to you okay, know, an Islamic so circumcision. Okay, so we'll start at the beginning. So when I do a traditional bris, the baby is on a double pillow on the lap of usually the grandfather who holds the baby's legs on the pillow while I perform the bris. The circumcision takes under 20 seconds. And anything which would increase the discomfort to the child is expressly prohibited. Do you use there, tools? I have your... tools, yes. Okay. I do have tools. Um, and I can probably even show you some of them. Okay. So, these are the four instruments. This is a probe that I will take and put inside to separate the skin. Because there are two layers of skin. There's the foreskin itself and a mucosal membrane underneath that. So I have to separate that from the head of the penis. Yep. I then insert the hemostat to grasp the skin. Pull right. it forward. Put on the clamp. Well, I guess we can do this for demonstration purposes. So that would be the foreskin the coming out of the top. The foreskin's here and the protected penis is underneath. Okay. That's so you remove it with a scalpel? Correct. And then you remove the, with the foreskin. Okay. Okay. How long does it take to heal? 24 to 48 hours is the primary healing. By a week to 10 days, done. Actually, um, again, it's, it's kind of funny because parents will go visit their pediatrician. Pediatrician takes off the W. Oh, Cantor Sherman did this, Briss. How, what's your, how do you identify? Because most of the brisses I do heal very quickly and, and the nurses will know who I am and they just, it's just, it's very nice. So in this kind of arena discussing male circumcision, there are some people who call themselves intactivists, which is a kind of mix of the word intact and activist. And they're out here campaigning for babies to not have any surgery done on them, to be left the way they are born. This is a worldwide revolution to protect all children, boys and girls from general cutting. And there have been questions about the motives behind this push towards ending male circumcision. And a lot of the more extreme sentiments in, in that movement veer on the side of anti-Semitism. If you take your penis in your hand, you will see a scar where you've been raped of essential elements of your humanity because of the demonstrably evil influence Judaism has on this country. So I think it's really important that we can have this conversation, even though it is difficult, but also not allow the platform to be dominated by people who have different kind of intentions and ulterior motives and want to kind of politicize this issue and use it against certain people. Sometimes you can see that um, people have genuine concerns about you know, health and the rights of kids, but then there's this other side where it seems to be driven a bit by anti-Semitic sentiments, right? Yes, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, yes. I think on the broader level, the lack of civility, the ability to have a discussion with somebody about a particular subject, 
with which you may not agree with that person, but to have it in a civil and a proper way. I think that doesn't happen enough these days. People spend so much time maybe Yelling and screaming and not listening. Yeah. I think I was a teenager, I went to someone's breast, just rubbing it all the way. And I don't really necessarily feel like rabbis are the ones to trust when it comes to a biological situation. So I'd probably do it in the hospital, yeah. Okay. Well, what if it's someone you've known that's done the entire family? You're getting like a spiritual Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it means more to the, to the tradition of having it done. No, nah, dude, I support that. I really do. You can invite me to your son's prayer, I'll come. Absolutely. <laughs> do you mind doing it? Do you mind? <laughs> Only if I do the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so little in this car. Really? Yeah, I do. I want to go and speak to um, a guy called Ellie today, who is a Jewish filmmaker. He's been kind of part of the intactivist movement. And I think he can kind of cast a light on where the issues kind of arise um, around speaking about male circumcision, the intactivist movement, and the kind of ownership that seems to have been taken uh, by some people around this. So it should be pretty interesting. Nice to meet you. Meet you. <laughs> How's it going? One of the things I just feel doing this whole thing is it's become the domain of the right. That's not the side that I would traditionally associate with human rights and autonomy of your body. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit different than some of the other people in this movement. I made a feature-length documentary in 2007, and I met a lot of wonderful genital autonomy activists the world over, actually, uh, through working on that film and touring with it and everything. And then after Donald Trump was elected, there was a sort of shift in the intactivist movement. Some of the prominent figures now are members of the alt-right. I spoke out against it. We need to have a conversation about anti-Semitism in the intactivist movement. How does it manifest itself? In 2011, they did that for making circumcision of minors illegal in San Francisco. And one of the people who was associated with the campaign was a man by the name of Matthew Hess. And he had a comic book series. It was sort of around genital autonomy themes. He had a character called Monster Mohel and it was just like this anti-Semitic imagery, so... I saw that when I was doing some research, I saw that. There's no doubt that those, those images are anti-Semitic. Yeah, yeah. If you're putting yourself out on a limb as a Jew speaking out against circumcision, and, you know, there's a tolerance of anti-Semitism in the movement, you're in an impossible situation. In a normal sort of topic that's uh, considered socially acceptable to discuss, um, you have pro, you have con, you have sort of civilized discussions about what's going on. And what happens with taboo subjects is the taboo breeds all sorts of crazy. So you describe self concision as like a taboo subject, right? I definitely haven't seen it spoken about properly in many mainstream places like abortion is. Why do you think that is? Genitals are a taboo subject. Like they are. You say that so loudly in here. Like. <laughs> I can see there was a woman behind the camera and she was looking over. I know. If my <laughs> wife were here, she'd be like, Ellie. <laughs> we need to think about this psychologically. If you're a man with a penis, talking about this has the potential to touch on, am I inadequate in some way? Or something may have been done to you when you were a baby that you were really uncomfortable about, that you are a le lesser of a sexual being because of it. It makes total sense to me that it would be easier for someone psychologically not to deal with those questions and just ignore it. Um, and that's sort of how taboos become taboos. If you was another man and you asked me this, I would have looked at you like, what the fuck? <laughs> would you have not spoken to me if I was a man? Would you not do this if I was a man? No, I would have answered it, but I probably wouldn't be here this long. <laughs> <laughs> how long have you guys known each other? How long? 10 years. 10 years? And you've never spoken about this? Never. Never talked about each other's penises either. <laughs> no. no. I think it's important to have this conversation, you know? When I do end up having kids, like, I'm actually educated about if it's, like, good or not to circumcise my kid. Maybe men should speak about circumcision amongst themselves more often. Men amongst men talking about their penises. Maybe they should. Yeah, I think so. So when I came to do this episode, I didn't really know what to expect. I did learn a lot, right? But that being said, I haven't like landed on a, a particular answer. I, I knew I wouldn't, right, because I'm a woman and I'm never going to be able to say, well, this is how I feel. But I definitely have heard so many guys talk, listened to so many different like, perspectives from men and just gone, wow, there is like, there is a conversation to be had here.
I feel like men and women need to feel comfortable with their bodies and I feel like women do talk a lot more about a lot more things. I find it interesting that this conversation about circumcision to so many guys I've spoken to are like, oh, I've never spoken about this. And isn't it weird that it was Sex in the City that had the conversation about circumcision? That's a show for women. Do you know what I mean? Like, is there a show for men? I hope you have enjoyed the different thoughts and um, opinions and experiences that have come out and that they've given you something to think about. Um, uh, please, you know, leave a thoughtful comment at the end. Um, and yeah, like, comment and subscribe to stay up to date with the rest of what we're going to do in this series. I'm going back to London after this, so I've got to stay out of trouble. No more UFC, no more Trump, no more circumcision. Like, get back onto dry land. <laughs>